Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. Hello, Exchange family. Welcome to another amazing show of Chief Chat. As you can tell, I am not Chief. I'm Emily. Um, Chief <laughs> is taking a tour of Europe um, to our Exchange stores right now. Um, so he unfortunately will not be joining us. But of course, we do have Kiana with me today. Um, so Kiana, hello. How's it going? Hi, Emily. Oh, it's so great. Of course, I'm super jealous that Chief is far, far away across the pond, but now he's having a great time um, interacting with our constituents and stakeholders out there. So cheers. Hey, what's up, Chief? <laughs> Everyone, um, Oconus, hello. Um, and I think he's been, yeah, he's been all over um, checking our stores and um, it's been awesome. But we have an amazing um, show today. And before um, I kick it out over to Kiana, I just want to thank the soldiers, airmen, guardian, marines, sailors, and Coast Guard members, as well as the military families for joining us today. So Kiana, without further ado, please let us know who we're chatting with today. <laughs> For sure. So today's guest is the Chief of the Child, Youth, and School Services Branch in the Soldier and Family Readiness Quality of Life Directorate. She is responsible for the policy and resource requirements required to execute nine core CYS programs, which are Child Development Centers, Family Child Care, School Age Care, Youth Programs, Youth Sports and Fitness Programming, Community-Based Child and Youth Programs, School Support Services, and Parent and Outreach Programs and Deployment Support. So she's here today to discuss her role in providing child care to military children. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Helen Ron Armo. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi. Helen. How's it going? Hi. Well, things are going really well. Um, we've been working really hard lately trying to um, get all of our programs and services lined up to celebrate Month of the Military Child. That's just around the corner. Um, we've been prepping our senior leaders for all of their congressional engagements um, that happen at this time of the year. So we've been busy trying to make sure that our soldiers and families have access to quality childcare and youth programs as they at their installation and as they move across the Army. Awesome. And of course, we are so appreciative and we can't wait to dive in more to what you do to make all of this not only happen for um, April for Month of the Military Child, but just all year round um, for our, our youth. So it's a pleasure to have you here today, as Thank well you. as during the month of Women's History Month. Um, and so where are you coming from um, today? Where are you joining us from? Well, normally I would be at my desk in the Pentagon, but today I'm at home at my home in Springfield, Virginia. Awesome. And in uh, we kind of talked about it before going live. You mentioned you're having a beautiful spring day there today. We we are having a beautiful spring day. I can look out my window here, and the sky <laughs> is blue, and the the buds are flying in the air from the little bit of breeze that's out there. So yeah, it is a great day to be in Northern Virginia for sure. Love to hear that. Yes, that's amazing. No, but we're so excited to chat about education and child care today, especially because the month of the military child is on the horizon. It's just next month and that's pretty much next week. So Helen, can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about yourself and then also how you found yourself working in army child youth and school programs? Well, well thank you. And, um, Really, thank you for having me today. Um, I, it's given me an opportunity to kind of go down child care memory lane. Um, I've been a part of the Army's Child and Youth Program for 38 years. Um, I started out in um, Aschaffenburg, Germany in 1984. And, and how I got there um, was um, because of my husband, like a lot of spouses in the military, um, my husband and I are dual federal service, um, civil service. Um, he accepted a job in Aschaffenburg, Germany. Um, I was a speech and language pathologist in a public school system, and I kind of wanted to finish out my years. So he left in January, and I joined him in that summer in July. And he assured me that when I got there, there would be a position in 
in the speech and language field that I could, you know, immediately get a job in. Well, that, of course, did not prove to be true. So I spent the first three months of my time in Germany um, hounding the civilian personnel office, trying to find a job, working through application after application, defending my background, and finally got a position as an infant room teacher in the local child development center. Um, and as I said, that was 38 years ago. And if you had told me then that I would be where I am now, I would have said, no, you're dreaming. I'll be back in the schools as a speech and language pathologist as soon as I can find a position there. Well, um, it took a few months and a little bit of like, what am I really doing here? I'm a speech and language pathologist. I'm in an infant room. I'm changing diapers. Um, this, is this really what I want to do? And, you know, after after a little bit of thinking about it, you know, he said, hey, you know, you're an expert in speech and language development. Use that skill um, to help these families and my fellow child care providers in helping these kids develop their, you know, their speech and their language. Um, that was a turning point for me. Um, I have to say I really got hooked. I fell in love with military families, um, fell in love with the little babies that I was taking care of. Really, um, you could you see the importance of your work every day. Um, like I said, I got hooked, and here I am today, 38 years later. Wow, now that's a great story. And that's incredible. And so, Helen, yeah. you are um, only the second person to hold the position of program director for Army Child, Youth, and School Services. Can you yeah. tell us about your experiences and opportunities that led you to this important quality of life mm -hmm. position that you hold today? Yeah. Yeah, when you say it that way, <laughs> the only the second person, it really is, it, you know, it makes me sit back and say, yeah, wow, wow. again, how did I get here? So, um, from that time in Germany, um, back in 1984, um, and the hook that childcare um, and the and the fire that it um, built in me, um, I moved ahead and became from a teacher became a center director. Um, from a center director, I was I um, applied for and received the position of the child and youth coordinator, which is a position responsible for the operation of the entire program on an installation. Um, a Schaffenberg was a a fairly small installation and. I had an opportunity um, in a few years to move on to a much larger installation in Nuremberg, Germany, um, where there were six child development centers and 275 family childcare homes that were spread across a very large section of Bavaria. Um, very challenging. Um, and at that same time, um, the Military Child Care Act um, came into play, and so there were a whole there were changes galore in the child and youth program at that time. But Nuremberg was a great um, a great opportunity for me to really learn about myself as a leader, um, to learn the management skills that were necessary to really you know take care of such a large program that was spread all over such a large area. Um, you know, to really connect with families, um, to to just work with a larger group of professionals with the same purpose, and that was to really reduce the conflict for our families between, you know, their parental responsibilities and the mission requirements um, that were ahead of them. Um, while I was in Nuremberg, you know, Operation Desert Storm um, happened. Um, quite a challenge for us. Um, most of our soldiers deployed. Um, we were, our families stayed, most of our families stayed behind. Um, we kept and managed six child development centers during that whole time of Desert Storm. And in addition, we opened a seventh child development center in, in the hospital that operated 24 hours, seven days a week for seven months. And we did that with the manpower that we already had on board because there really was no way to recruit any extra staff at that time. So there were some pretty challenging days. Um, I know myself, along with several of my other staff members, worked every day from the 1st of February that year until the 1st of September um, without a day off. Um, 
working weekends and evenings and overnights to keep that center operating while doing your regular job every day from nine to five and um, making sure that you took the time to um, work with all the staff and continue to support them through all of the challenges that they were having. Because as you know, in, if, when you're in Europe, most, most of our staff are military spouses. Um, it was a very, very challenging time. But when I look back, it was the greatest experience that I've had in my entire career. Um, it taught me everything I need to know about how to manage a child and youth program. It taught me what I needed to do to um, keep staff motivated, um, how important it was to communicate and make sure that everybody was aware of every um, opportunity available to them and to know that they were supported through a difficult time. Um, I learned a lot of lessons at that point in time, but um, as luck would have it, there were a couple of other promotion possibilities there after Desert Storm, which I took advantage of. Um, moved back to the States some uh, after that, um, had some experience at another installation in the, in the United States, and then moved here to the Washington, D.C. area where I've been for the past 20 odd years or so, and um, have worked my way up from a training specialist in a, in a training academy for MWR and Child and Youth Services um, through about 10 different positions. Um, and so I have experience again at all, all different levels and until I ended ended where I am here today. So that's kind of where I got, how I got here. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I think we're going to talk a little later on a little bit about, you know, the influences in your life. But, you know, I want I want to say at this point that um, I would not be anywhere I am today without the incredible mentorship of some very strong, very intelligent um, leaders in the child and youth field, um, um, starting with the person whose job I now occupy. Um, her name was Miss M.A. Lucas, and um, she like she held this job for almost you know 28 years. Um, other women, um, very strong women, who were my mentors from the time I was in a shop in Berg, Germany, um, as I worked my way through different positions until I came here to the national capital region, I have been the recipient of that mentorship and, and guidance. And, you know, I hope that in my career, I've been able to offer that same mentorship and guidance to, you know, other women that I've worked with and, and men as well in the field of child and youth um, so that they can also um, see a goal for themselves and attain that. So. No, that's great. So we talked a lot about your background and just all the wealth of experience that you have, especially just being in challenging situations and overcoming those challenges to learn more and to pivot and be better. So like everything else in the world, education has changed so much in the last 30 years, last 20 years, even the last decade, especially as technology continues mm -hmm. to evolve, right? So what are some of the changes or initiatives that kind of lead how Army CYS does child youth school services today? Ah, so great question. Um, over the course of my tenure, um, you know, we've seen a lot of changes. So, you know, back in the early 90s, um, you know, military child care was called the ghetto of child care. You know, not we were not exactly the program that we are today. We had we had our challenges, um, both in how we operated our programs in the facilities that we used to provide that care in. And in 1989, um, Congress passed the Military Child Care Act that really prescribed um, the, um, the, the regulations and the policies and, the, and established the oversight to ensure that the programs that we offered meant the developmental needs, the physical needs and the social needs of the children in our care that the training requirements um, were spelled out for us and that we had staff to execute that training, um, that background checks were um, applied in a, in a systematic way so that um, the people that we put in our classrooms um, did not have any derogatory information in their backgrounds. 
and and more importantly, um, provided the oversight to ensure that um, we ran these programs um, in accordance with all of those um, regulations and policies. So um, I had the opportunity back then um, in 1989 to be part of the first inspection team um, in Europe. Um, we visited um, 14 installations in, in a month. Um, we're on the road a lot. Um, and you know, found some very interesting things, you know, and the reasons why that, that Military Child Care Act needed to be put in place. And I'll, you know, I'll just tell you about one of those instances. We were at an installation in a small child development center that um, had a second floor. And in the second floor was a, a social club for um, single soldiers. And, and um, but the entrance to that, um, social club for soldiers happened to be for them to walk through the infant room in this child development center to a door to go upstairs to um to the club and so you're there was just something amiss about that right and maybe even before right. the military child care act needed to be instituted to say maybe we have a problem with all of these gentlemen walking through the the child development center through the infant room you know all day long so um and certainly that does not happen today but um you know, um, still, people were still doing the best that they knew how to do and, you know, in situations sometimes that they didn't control. But rest assured that, when, you know, when we left at the installation after the inspection, that that access to that room did not occur anymore through the infant room in that child development center. So, um, we, um, you know, you learn through hard work and, you know, working, like I said, about, you know, six months every day and um, sometimes overnight and on weekends that the importance of the work that you do so you know having that opportunity to work through desert storm i, I you know really honestly has just um <laughs> i'm gonna you want a little humor moment here um i do have a little bit of cat that's trying to steal my earphones oh, and my <laughs> so if you see a cat jump up i apologize right away so yes. um, my fingers are crossed <laughs> your fingers are crossed thanks so I don't, I don't need that to happen but um um and yeah um and so you know and, and i really had that opportunity to move through many levels of uh, of work but again i go back to the importance of you know, the mentorship um, that I received from my senior leaders, whether they're the military leaders or the leaders in our child in our child care program, um, without them, without them, I would not be where I am today. The program would not be where it is today. And my ability to influence the program and, you know, take it in a new direction, um, look at technology to help us look at you know some great opportunities that we have to improve the skills of the caregivers in our classrooms um, to make connections from when our, when our children begin with us at you know four weeks or six weeks of age right until the time they graduate from high school um, to be able to make those connections and um, have a, a path of growth from from that time and change the way we operate to accommodate all those different needs of those different age groups that we serve in different ways and you're right in the youth arena technology is such an important part of their lives and the transition to more technology in our programs you know keeps those children engaged and and, and gives them a, a healthy safe outlet you know at, in after school hours um, in t in the in 2000 we also um at the behest of the chief of staff of the army at that time developed a school support program and there were uh, at the time um, military members be, were the school liaison officers at installations and essentially what they did was they just manage manage buses and keeping children safe on buses as they travel back and forth to school handled some discipline programs um but really we never had the help for families as they transition from one school um, to another to deal with records transfers, um, classes, um, you know, if you're on the football team and you transfer in, you know, and you can't play because you came in in October and the season's half over. Um, 
we, we started a partnership with the Military Child Care Coalition and developed a whole school liaison program, which still operates today. Um, the, the work resulted in a military compact between all 50 states and DC and Puerto Rico to ensure that our transitioning military children um, receive the assistance at a gaining and a losing and a losing school to ensure that they are not negative, negatively impacted because of the military lifestyle. So um, in all areas of our programs, um, we've, tr we've kept up with technology, we've kept up with the emerging needs of our military families. Um, we have some challenges now making sure we have enough childcare for folks after COVID. We are working diligently to look at all arenas of initiatives to, in, you know, to encourage people to apply for our programs and begin their career in very child and youth programs um, in all of our school age child and, and school support programs. So um, lots going on, um, adjustments being made all the time to accommodate um, the different needs and requirements. Um, taking care of families is first and foremost um, our mission. Um, the Secretary of Defense and our Secretary of the Army um, have entrusted us to ensure that, you know, from our from our standpoint, that we take care of children and youth, um, and have uh, as as immediate access to these services and programs as we can possibly provide in the environment that we're in right now. Awesome. So you stay pretty busy, for sure. No, we do. Awesome. We do stay pretty busy, right? No, we love that, and we appreciate you sharing that. And so. Um, to kind of piggyback on that, so what are some of the pivotal moments in your career, as well as what drives you to continue to advocate and plan for child, youth, and school services today? Mm. Uh, pivotal moments. Again, I'm going to go back to, I have to go back to Nuremberg, and I hate to, you know, continue to repeat that, but um, um, that moment in time, like I said, just, um, it just, made it clear to me how important these services and programs were for our military families and what drives us to continue to do this because i'm not the only person out there who's been in the field a really long time um what drives you is the first time you really you know you watch a mother and a child or and a soldier and their child you know walk in or out of that military child development center and you see the tremendous responsibility that's placed on you mm -hmm. to ensure that these children are safe, whether it's coming in and out of the CDC, um, playing baseball on, at the baseball field or being at a youth lock-in program overnight. Um, you understand the, the real importance of the work that you do. You see the results of it every day. Um, even sitting here from a policy perspective as you write policy and talk about strategies um, when you actually walk down to it you know out to an installation and you visit it and you you see and you say ah you know my the policy that i wrote there helped that happen um it makes you want to go back and write another policy so that you know you can see the results of your of your work instantly and i think that's what keeps me and everybody else that i work with every day um doing the work that they do um I could probably sit here and tell you that there are very few people in a child and with program who work an eight hour day. Um, I work, you know, none of us work very few of, you know, very many of them. Uh, and um, again, uh, just looking, you know, seeing the results of your work every day, understanding the importance and really understanding that you really do have, you do impact the, the safety of the nation by making sure that our soldiers, children, are safe in our care and that they can focus on their mission. Um, that keeps us going every day. No, that sounds like a really fulfilling job. And we thank you for all that you do as well to support our military community as a whole. And you did touch a bit on this in the beginning where you mentioned the challenge for military spouses to find a job, to find a position whenever you know they're right. out in the field. And in your place, you know, you were following your husband who um, is in civil service, but a lot of these wives, um, husbands, partners are following, you know, their service member, and maybe they have like a real estate license, or they have a teaching degree or whatever the case might be, but they 
still find right. it challenging. Um, so what kind of resources, I guess, um, do military spouses have when they are considering a career in military child care? Hmm. Well, you know, we I'm a perfect example of how you can have a career in military child care for a very long time. Um, and I, you know, I will have the capability to take advantage of, of several of the moves that we had in our, in our careers. And my husband and I have moved um, eight times in the 38 years, which is not even close probably to what a, a military spouse might move, but I do understand what that means. Um, but everywhere I went, I had a job and, you know, could apply for a job and there were, were really available for me in the child care arena, um, whether it was in child, youth, or in the school program area. And to, to military spouses, I would say that there will always be a job, no matter where you're stationed. Um, we have vacancies at every installation around the world. We would con we consider, um, you know, military spouses gets first preference to our jobs. And like I said, it's a career that can move around with you wherever you go because we have childcare everywhere that you go. So um, it is hard work, um, but it is extremely rewarding work. And there are uh, opportunities, tremendous opportunities for advancement and training and professional development. Um, if you're a staff member now, you know, your your childcare fees are reduced, um, and 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 a lot of other initiatives to encourage you um, from um, recruitment and retention bonuses, um, like I said, to a lot of additional training and professional development that will help you not only in a childcare career but whatever any other career that you might um, want to go into. So. No, that's great. Uh, oh, and let, please don't let me forget, don't let me forget the great opportunity um, to become a family child care provider. You know, one of the very important delivery options that you addressed when you talked about the nine programs that I am, um, that I oversee. Um, family child care is really an important part of our delivery options, especially for single or dual military soldiers who have a lot of extended hours work, um, who are deployed, who, you know, have TDY for training. Um, it, it's difficult to manage those extended hours or evenings or overnights in, in child development centers. And um, a more appropriate setting is a more home-like setting for children who, you know, who have to have that separation for their from their parents. Um, and, and you know, I, I talked about the fact that in Nuremberg, I had 275 family childcare homes just in one community. Um, at this point in time, we don't even have 275 family child care homes across the entire army. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, there's, you know, tremendous um, stress put on families these days. And, you know, to give up your home, to run a business in it with, you know, real life children running around, you know, is probably a pretty um, hefty sacrifice. Um, but we're working to try and make that um, a more reasonable um, job for you, for, for our family members. Um, we've just instituted um, initiatives that provide you um, a fee assistance subsidy. So um, a, a, an entry level family child care provider, you know, can, you know, increase their salary almost in, by half, um, increase it by half, right? Double their salary, um, you know, in, in this new initiative program. So. Um, I would really encourage, you know, spouses um, who maybe have young children who are young, who don't have a lot of background yet, you know, it's a great way to build a resume, to learn how to run a business, um, and a great opportunity, again, you know, to serve families and, and children, so. Awesome. And um, we did mention yeah. this earlier in the show as well. April is the month of the military child. Um, so. And a lot of great things yeah. happen this month. And I actually can't believe we're already here. 2023 just seems to be really right. Yeah. But, um, so can you tell us about some of the MOMC events that stand out to you and what families and children can look forward to this month and what um, and what can army leaders do to support these efforts? Okay. Sure. Um, I'd love to tell you about two um, awesome um, month of the military child activities that I have in my past. Um, 
again, Absolutely. I'm back in Nuremberg, Germany, but it was a great place to be. So um, yeah. one year um, in the city of Nuremberg, um, they hosted the International Toy Fair, right? It was, you know, a huge building filled with every kind of toy you can imagine. And at, at the, the end of that International Toy Fair, just happened to be the beginning of Month of the Military Child. And through some great um, partnerships with some organizations in Germany, um, the international, the association of that international toy fair gave us in Nuremberg all of the toys that were left over from the displays um, from all the toy vendors. And we had a warehouse full of Barbie dolls and um, the beautiful German Steiff stuffed animals and train sets and all the highest quality. And we were able to distribute them to our child development family, to the children in our care. Um, we had our own little mini toy fair where we, you know, raffled off all of the trains that we were given. It was a great month of the military child that year. Um, and the next year, we used to always like let um, release balloons in honor of month of the military child. And, you know, um, you know, we decided that that probably was an environmentally safe to have all these balloons out there. So um, in Nuremberg, we were able to um, um, work with the hot air balloon company. And so instead of launching all of our little balloons, we actually launched a hot air balloon and our, our, in, our garrison commander wrote it up and, um, we celebrated, uh, that was our balloon launch for month of the military child. So, but That's typically awesome. around the army, um, you know, you'll see, um, book fairs and, you know, art displays and, um, you know, um, sport, little sports events and little fests and, um, get uh, commanders reading to children and parents reading to children. And you'll see artwork on display. Um, every installation out there has its own flair and its own um, uh, um, programs that they put on. And, you know, some of them are, you know, centuries old. You know, they you do the same thing every year because, you know, the communities and the children kind of expect it. Um, from an Army headquarters level, um, we'll have a month's worth of tweets um, about fun things that you can do with your child all through the month of the military child. Um, We'll be sharing some artwork and encouraging everybody to remember that um, to purple up for military kids um, all through the month, but particularly on, on April 3rd. So you can find a lot of those um, exciting adventures on armymwr.com slash child and youth. Um, you'll be able to find some activities there and you can go to every installation website and um, there will always be, a, you know, a, a link for the activities on that individual installation for Month of the Military Child. So I see you're showing some of that in the background. Yes, yes. now perfect. Definitely head over to the website and learn more and get your military child involved in all the great things that the Army CYS is doing. Speaking of all the great things, Helen, yeah. you plan to retire soon. So retirement is on the horizon for you. So out of it all is. of your yes, it is. Yeah. No, bittersweet, I'm sure. <laughs> but out of all of yeah. the advice that you've kind of learned from your mentors and the experiences you have, what is the best advice you can give to the up and coming leaders in child and youth services? Well, the first thing I would tell them is to invest in their professional development. Um, it is very important to not um, sit at your desk and, you know, say that I can't leave because, because my job is too important. Um, I, I would absolutely positively first thing, invest in your own professional development. The second thing I would say is to find a mentor and a battle buddy. Your mentor will help you, um, see your vision, um, plan a way forward for you, tell you where the opportunities are for growth. Um, and your battle buddy will help you on your day-to-day -day crisis. Um, and, you know, someone that you can talk to in, when you're struggling or when things are going really well, um, you need a battle buddy. So find a friend. Um, I always had a battle buddy and, you know, colleagues 
um, around the world. I still have those same battle buddies today. So um, uh, always have a plan. Um, and if you have a plan, then um, a crisis is always much easier to deal with. And I learned that again in the early years of Desert Storm. Um, if you plan ahead, um, it's a whole lot easier to execute something that you believe in rather than something that's told to you to do. So always have a plan and then always find a way to say yes. Um, so many times when families need to be helped, um, we always we use a regulation or a policy as a way to say no. And I would just challenge all new leaders to always really read through all of that policy and try and always find a, a way to say yes to families and support them in their child, youth, and school services needs. So this would be my four biggest pieces of advice to future leaders. So the Army has brought back its Be All You Can Be campaign, focusing on opportunity. So in your professional experience, how has the Army allowed mm. you to be all that you can be? Mm. Great question. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to go back and talk about that investing in professional development. Um, I have had some outstanding opportunities to not only progress through military leadership trainings, but also to participate in um, to professional development in the you know in private sector childcare, um, so that um, my my knowledge and skills were always up to date. Um, that certainly one allowed me to be all that I could be. Um, the second thing that allowed me to be all I could be is just the, again, the great support from my mentors over the years um, who always had advice and always could point me in the right direction and to make the right decisions. Um, and to be all you can be, why? Again, it was that it's that great connection between knowing what you're doing makes a difference. And so you kind of carry that through a lot of other decision that that you make in your life. Um, you know, what's the what in all of that you do? And to be all you can be, you need to know what the what is as well. So um, I'm excited to see that come back. Um, I thought it was a great slogan to begin with. Um, I've watched the commercials on television right now, and there is one where the commercial kind of ends with a bunch of young recruits um, headed off to their MOBDEP station. You know, they're they're brand new and headed in that way, and they focus in on the young man looking out the window. What you know, what's what's up out there for me? And I kind of felt that way on my way to Germany for the very first time. Um, but the opportunity to be all you could be is there for us every single day in what we do, um, because what we be for are all those little children out there. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Helen, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you today and learning more about your career and your background, but also the child care programming offered to military families. So before we go, can you let our viewers know where they can find more information on the Army CYS? Sure. Um, Again, one of the best sites to go to right now to find out information about the programs on our installations and the capabilities that are on our installations, again, is to go to armymwr.com slash, um, there's a big long one, but it's just Child and Youth Services. So from that armymwr webpage, you'll find that Child and Youth Services um, section on there, and it will provide you all the information that you need to know first about careers and secondly, about how to have your children involved in the program. Um, also, uh, a website that you may not see up there is militarychildcare.com. Um, it's the website that families use to gain to um, request care in, in our programs. So again, it's militarychildcare.com, not too difficult to remember. And so you'll find out information about programs. You'll also find out information about job opportunities and you'll you'll see a lot of information about you know how and why the programs are run the way they are um and military one source um, dot mil is also a great opportunity to find out information not only about child care but any other information you may need as a military spouse or military members about the services that are available to you and your families 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. And for our Chief Chat viewers, this episode is available on YouTube for future viewing. If you're looking for ways to celebrate your military child, the exchange is saluting America's youngest heroes throughout the month of April. Visit shopmyexchange.com slash MOMC for more information on free events, sweepstakes, and so much more. Also, be sure to join us back here at 11 a.m. Central on March 30th when actress Sophia Hasmik joins the chat. And then join us again at 11 a.m. Central on April 18th when we welcome Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen and Sergeant Major Michael Perry to the chat ahead of PCS season to give us some tips in that arena. And then again, mark your calendars for 11 a.m. Central on Thursday, June 1st, when retired Special Forces veteran Scott Neal joins the chat. So Helen, thanks so much for joining us today. Having you with us means so much to the military community. Thank you. Yeah, and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity today. Thanks. Absolutely. And Helen, we just ask um, if you could just hang on after this live so we can say our formal goodbyes to you. Um, but okay. uh, I guess Kiana will do Chief Chat's little goodbye since he's not here. So we'll see if we can do it. His Chief Chat. Oh, yeah. Are on three. Okay. Two. We're doing it together. One, yes. two, three. Chief, Chief chat, chat out. out. <laughs> no. Chat okay. out. Bye, everyone.